I think the worship has been so good, I don't want to spoil the mood. So let me just go straight into the word of God. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 to verse 38. We read it. I make a prayer. Then I'll pick it up from there. This is a continuation of where we left last Sunday. Uh, I had five things to, sh to talk to you that happens when we fail to advance. I guess for those who are here last Sunday, you, we placed a comma. So I have no intention to go back to what I shared last Sunday. I will just pick it up from there. I'm assuming the service is still going on. Is that okay? So we are going to go to the next three things that remained that uh, happened to the early church when they failed to advance. And that scripture, we peg it to Matthew 9, 36 to 38, which we read together, that says the following words. In uh, our reference scripture, Matthew 9, 30, I'm waiting for the, my good friends to put it on, uh, on the screen, chapter 9, verse 36 to verse 38. And it says, but when, can we read together? When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then verse uh, 20, 37 says, And he said unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Then verse 38, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's make a prayer. Father, we are thankful for this morning. It has been such a wonderful day for us, especially from the time we walked into this sanctuary in our first service, and also in this service, we've seen your mighty hand upon us. We have seen you, Lord, minister your blessing in our worship, and also speak to us in your word. And so I pray even as I speak to this congregation for the next few minutes, may you give me your word to speak to them. Help me, Lord, in utterance, and also help me as I speak it. In Jesus' name, we pray, and together we say, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Now, let me try my best to see whether I can, in the next few minutes, to deliver those three things that actually remained last Sunday. Now, we realize that uh, the early church had its own challenges in understanding the commission. That is the command Jesus had given to them when he commanded them in Matthew chapter 28, and verse 19 and 20. As I said, that command is equivalent to the same command that God gave Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2 that we are using as our theme scripture that says, Arise, get over this Jordan into the land which I'm giving to you and take possession over it to the children of Israel. Now, that command is equivalent to the gospel, uh, what we call as the great commission that the Lord gave the church. Because Israel had the land before them and they were to walk in and take it. And the church has the world before us for us to walk in and bring as many people, make as many people disciples of Jesus as we can. Now, unfortunately, we have not paid a lot of attention to that command. And many of us have taken a, 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 a back seat. We are happy to enjoy fellowship like we have done today. We are happy to come and sing and give our offerings. And once we are done with that, we call it worship and we go home. But we don't realize that the purpose of being a believer, why God called you to become a believer, the reason for salvation for every believer was for us to become those that would be able to take this gospel to the nations of the world. And I strongly believe that everyone who is a believer is supposed to be a missionary. God has not called any of us to sit back and not take this commission where we are supposed to go. So the early church is a good example that we can draw from to understand what happens when we do not or what are the failures that we go through when we fail to arise and advance into the kingdom of God? And we realize that after Jesus had given them the Holy Spirit, because the command was you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, then you will become to be my witnesses. They needed that empowerment. They needed that endowment of power for them to be able to demonstrate that Jesus died, rose again, and ascended to heaven. And indeed, on the day of Pentecost, that power was given to the church. And the Lord began to work with them. And we saw that in, one, in, in the two examples, in the two reasons that I gave you. That there was such a move of the Holy Spirit that the church grew tremendously. An explosion took place. That the whole of Jerusalem had the gospel. People were born again. 
Signs and wonders took place. Healings were taking place. Miracles were happening everywhere. Because the Lord wanted to demonstrate to the world that he is the savior of the world. Unfortunately, the church ended up in Jerusalem, taking no action but just sitting in and enjoying the fellowship and the company of one another. And then we came to realize that there were five things which I picked among many others, which the church in Jerusalem failed to do. The first failure, they didn't understand the scope of the Great Commission. They thought the Great Commission would be fulfilled by them sticking in Jerusalem. Just like many of us think when we come to church, that is where the gospel is preached. By the way, in church, we don't preach the gospel. In church, we disciple believers. Make them disciples. But the gospel is actually preached out where the sinner is. That's where the gospel is preached. So they failed to understand the magnitude of the scope of their mission. That, that was the point we shared last Sunday. In that people came from all other cities to Jerusalem. Instead of them going to those cities, the command was go beginning from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. They thought it is come ye. We have changed that scripture. Instead of saying go ye, we say come ye to Gospel Centers International. Or to Jerusalem, Gospel Centers International. All right. So that's what happened. So the second, the second failure they had, they put structures in that church. And I'm repeating what I said last Sunday. Structures that would maintain status quo. Because as the church continued to grow, multiple problems came in. Multiple challenges came in. What they could do when there were few, they couldn't do it now. They could eat food without issues. But now the food was too little for everybody that issues began to come up. With greater church, with a greater number, with a multiplied number, challenges also come. So we end up putting up structures to maintain ourselves rather than dis dis uh, distributing ourselves out there to reach the rest of the world. That's what the church did. And we know they appointed Stephen and Philip among the other seven for them to be able to maintain the status quo, to take care of the business in the church, feed the people in the church, give them uh, food when they need food, help in managing their, the growth of that church. But that wasn't the mind of God. The Lord doesn't grow us for us to sit and just be happy among ourselves. God grows us that we may be able to go out and be a blessing to the communities where we are coming from. And that's the reason why I was so blessed yesterday when I saw many of you turning up for our exercise out there in the community. And by the way, we did a fantastic job. I'm sure when you came in, you saw. The place is neat, isn't it? As you are coming to the church. It was our, it was our ministry to the community. You know? We want the people to know we are not just coming for, to church on Sunday. We want them to know there are people in this place who care about them. Not just their spiritual caring, but also their physical and even their environment care. So these people failed to put structures that would support the mission work. Instead, they put structures to support themselves to remain in the church and enjoy fellowship and continue eating and having a good time. And this now led to the third thing, which I want to mention to you here very, very quickly. The third thing was God brought a persecution upon that church. God brought a persecution upon this church because I'm calling this, this third point, I'm saying the church failed to understand the external threats. Those persecutions which were coming were meant to thrust them out. So they were not only, God wasn't punishing them, those who are thrusting agents. The word when Jesus says that God may send forth laborers, another translation says God may thrust out laborers. Now the word thrust here means forcing out, pushing and forcing out, forcing out forcefully. Now what we cannot do when God has mandated us, God will force us to do them. So I was telling the first church, when you see people moving or get, go, going through challenges and they are believers, Many times, it's not that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that God is punishing you. When your boss just becomes a problem and he tells you, I want to transfer you from Nairobi to Mandera. And of course, you know how Mandera looks like. And you begin to ask Pastor Joyce to pray for you. And you begin rebuking your boss and, and, and asking the devil in that boss to stop. All right? Sometimes it's not the devil in the boss. Sometimes God looks at you and he realizes you have sat long enough in that place without telling anybody about Jesus. Or maybe you are preached enough in that place. He just wants you to go to Mandera so that you can let a Muslim who has never heard about Jesus hear the good news of the kingdom. I don't know that you're getting my point. That is what we mean by trusting. The church in Jerusalem was very comfortable. They were very happy. They were enjoying themselves. In fact, the Bible tells me they, they were so glad. They, the place was so respected. The people out there respected the church. Even some of the leaders, they also were obedient to the faith. But that wasn't the heart of God. 
The heart of God was, go ye into the whole world. And I, I can tell you, if they had simply obeyed that, it would have never had any persecution in Jerusalem. But God brought it to literally force them out, actually to thrust them out. And we can see when we look into the scripture, point number three, they failed to understand that external threats were thrusting agents for them. So the persecution was visited upon the church as a thrusting, a pushing, a forceful agent to get them out of Jerusalem to preach the gospel outside there. If you look at Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, let me go there very quickly. Then I'll mention two other things and I'll be done with this point, okay? Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Can somebody put that in an, in a, an easier version for my dear friends here to understand the meaning of the word consenting? It says, And Saul approved of his execution. This is now Stephen. When Stephen died, Saul was the man behind the death of Stephen. The man we call in the Bible today, Paul. And it says, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. It was not a general persecution. They targeted the church in Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem had now become a place where people from other cities were coming in. Instead of the disciples going out to those cities, people were coming from Judea. They were coming from Samaria. They were coming from Galilee. All of them coming to be ministered to in Jerusalem. And I want to ask us, let's not allow persecution to come in our church. Can I say something here? If you preach where you are, if you go beyond the church borders, I can tell you we'll continue enjoying fellowship here. But when that doesn't happen, people begin murmuring. When the church is just contented with the in inward ministry, when we begin just to feel good among ourselves, we begin fighting over the pulpit. We begin fighting and murmuring against one another. But when our mind is mission-oriented, when we know our ministry is not here, our ministry is out, the church is a place of refueling, a place where we come in and we are energized. We come into the church for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We come to the church for us to enjoy communion with God. And once we've gotten what we need to get and we've been energized and we've been refueled afresh, we get out of the church and we go out into the world where the sinner is. We witness to them and we bring them back to the church for refueling. I'm, I'm keeping quiet for you to get it. It's not for us to fight over the puppet. Who will sing? Who will preach? No, no, no. Who, who will be called reverend? Apana. The church is a place where disciples are made. And once you become a disciple, you go out and preach the gospel. So the mistake now that they did, to this, as, as I add on this point, they had taken the best of their cream in the church and turned them, instead of them going out to preach like Stephen and Philip and the rest of the people, they turned them into managing the things which were going on in the church. And they picked Stephen and they made him the manager or the deacon or the elder or the pastor in charge of catering. So he became the catering manager in the church. I want you to imagine me asking Pastor Joyce or Pastor Alan there to become now the manager of the kitchen. And with all what she has that she can deliver here or he has, I take them to the kitchen to be making sure when you finish fellowship, you are eating food very well. But let me say something. With what God had given this man, the best that they had among themselves, so when they say, let's look for the best among us, it was not meant for them to do the social work in the church. Actually, the Holy Ghost is not given to us for us to use it just for social business in the church. The Holy Ghost is given for us to preach the gospel. So even this Stephen man, believe me, out there, Stephen was so powerful that the kitchen could not contain him. And I can tell you, when you are full of the Holy Ghost, this pulpit will not contain you. It will not contain you when you are filled with the power of God. Believe me, look at that scripture. Perhaps if we went, I, I, I want to get it right. I want to get that scripture right. If you go to chapter 6, chapter 6 from verse 8, Acts chapter 6 from verse 8, to, to, to qualify the words I'm talking about here. Chapter 6 from verse 8, up to around verse 11. Is it verse 11 or verse, verse 13? Look at the quality of people whom they had made managers of food in the church. And the purpose was simple, to maintain status quo, to make sure nothing happens to our members. They don't leave church. We just want to maintain them here. We want others to come and join us. We don't want to go where they are. They elected the best of what they had. And one of those best was, was, was Stephen and Philip, among others, in the order in which they're mentioned in the Bible. But look, it says, and Stephen, help me here, full of what? Faith and full of 
power. What did he do? He did wonders and miracles among the people. It means his gift wasn't in food. The Holy Ghost wasn't a food agent. The Holy Ghost was meant for this man to preach the gospel in great power and glory. And we see wonders and miracles accompanying this man, Stephen, as he was preaching. That the Bible says in verse 9, can you go to verse 9? Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Liberians, Libertians, and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them of Sicilia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Now, because what seemed to be very good in the eyes of the people wasn't very good in the eyes of God. Remember when we read, the Bible says when they decided to appoint, this thing pleased everybody. And I can tell you, there are things which may please us here. But when God looks from heaven, he realizes, uh -uh, that is for them. It is not for the kingdom. Unless that thing answers to the great commission. Now listen to me. Unless what we do answers to the great commission. And the great commission is preaching the gospel. Believe me, any other gimmick we, we do is gimmickry, as somebody calls it. So for them, God was looking from heaven. They are appointing Stephen and the others to maintain status quo in the church. But God is saying, uh uh, this is not what I needed. I wanted this man to go and preach the gospel. So he caused some fellows in the church to begin raising accusations against Stephen. They began looking for anything that they would accuse Stephen for. Of course, as it looks in the eyes of men, these people were wrong. But let me tell you, in the eyes of God, he was tearing them up so that God can do what? He can trust them, kick them out of the church, scatter them everywhere. That's the way I read those portions of scripture. I don't look at persecution there as God punishing the church. No. God was using persecution to make sure they leave Jerusalem. They go to Judea, to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So they found some, they found some fellows. Then they began working on them. Let's go to verse, nine, I mean, verse 10 and 11. And they, were, and they were not able, listen, even though they were looking for something in Stephen's life, the Bible says they were not able to resist, help me here, what? The wisdom and the spirit which, with which he spoke. Meaning Philip, I mean Stephen, was so pure and so anointed that even the things they were trying to say about him, it was not possible for them to find any fault in him. To tell me, God was behind the scenes just to stir up something that would cause the church to move out. Verse 11. Today I'll read the scripture. Verse 11. Then there's the word sabond. Can you change that? Please, media. So fellows, there are some fellows here who are not King James. So let, let's look at this. The words, they did what? Secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And this was good enough to make the, the council that was in Jerusalem to accuse Stephen and kill him. So what they did, they, were look, they looked for something. And the only thing they would say is he's speaking blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And let me say, tell, tell, tell you something. Stephen wasn't killed by political leaders. No. Saul wasn't a political leader. Saul was a member of the highest council in the then the synagogue or in the, the highest council among the Jewish leaders. Actually, the people who, cruci who killed Stephen were the church, members of the church. Like today, the gen what I would call as NCCK or what I would call here as uh, Evangelical Alliance of Kenya, they came together and they said, this is not the kind of uh, 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 principles or the kind of doctrine we believe in. He is violating our doctrine. And the Bible tells me there was one man by the name of Saul. This man was highly respected, a very good lawyer. A man who was very good status in that particular place. He went and he says, allow me to lead a squad to finish this man that is called Tim, I mean, I mean, Stephen and his lot. So that's when Saul is given letters and is given permission. And Saul now goes out blasting out there to, to, to persecute the church. Verse 12. Let's go to verse 12. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. These are the members of the synagogue people who believed in Moses, and they came upon him, that is Stephen, and seized him, Wakam Shika, and brought him before the council. Now Stephen is in the church, Jerusalem. Pastor Joyce is sitting here. We, they remove her, literally. And they drag her to NCCK, or they drag her to ICC. Is it ICC or what? This thing of uh, ethics and whatever. Yeah, they take her there, and they accuse her there. 
And while they are there, Saul is standing there. So Saul stirs up the people who are there. And they take stones and they begin stoning who? Stephen. And Stephen dies. Now the big question that I want to bring to our attention here, as I explore this, sec need, need this question very quickly. The question I want to ask here, whom were they targeting? What, what was the target here? The persecution was targeting who? If you check in the Bible, it was targeting the church at Jerusalem. And number two, it targeted, the first people were targeted were the leaders who had been appointed. I ask myself this question. How can God tell us to appoint leaders? Then the following day, he kills them. Would that be God? No. You will begin questioning, is that really God? Meaning that although it appeared like the structures were good, which they were putting in place, those structures lacked something which God had to stir for it to happen. And what the structure lacked was they were not answering to the Great Commission. Meaning we can have every good structure in our church. We can have good worship. We can have good elders. We can speak well on the microphone. We can flash lights. But if it doesn't answer to the Great Commission, Nibure. Nibure. This way I want to encourage every member of GCI. Think mission. Have a mission mind wherever you are. Whether you are in your office, be mission oriented. When you are working on the street, be mission oriented. When you go to your community, share the love of God. That's why we have our CPS. Let me give you another scripture. Acts chapter 8, verse 4 to 7, quickly. I do, I do the, the, the other one, I move. I can see I, I have only 10, 10 more minutes to, I mean, 15 more minutes to go here. Chapter 8, verse 4 to 7. It says this, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the word. So the persecution became so tough. And the idea behind the persecution was to kick them out. To kick them out. Meaning every believer who went out, he went out now to answer to that question, to that call that Jesus had said. Because Jesus, when he looked at the, the, the world, he looked at the people who are following him. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Because in our thinking, the laborers are the pastors, particularly the bishop, the evangelist, the prophet, and the apostle. Today, those are the people who have been left to preach. Members look at them as the men and the women called by God to preach. But I want to demystify that by telling you, it is not the apostles and the prophets who are called to preach. Actually, all of us, we are called to be preachers. All of us are called to be preachers. It is not the apostles and the bishops. Now, the Bible says in chapter 8, if you go there, verse 4, We've done verse 4. Look at verse, verse 5 and verse 6 and 7. Verse 5 says, And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And I'll come back to Philip much later. Number 8, number 6. And the people with one accord gave heed to those, the things which Philip spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles. Verse 7. Verse 7 quickly. Okay, let's go to verse 8. Verse 8. Verse 8 says, And there was great joy in that city. Now, we've seen Stephen is dead. But look at Philip. Where does Philip go? Philip goes to Samaria. But again, as I've said, all the people who were scattered, they all went out preaching the gospel. In the book of Acts chapter 9, verse 31, and I'll end this point on this one. I am sure as you look at that verse, the persecution was simply to thrust out Stephen and thrust out Philip. Philip was number two in the order in which they were called or in the order in which they were elected. And the rest of the people followed. Everybody in Jerusalem who was a believer was a target of this persecution. And the idea was very simple. Simply to let us understand the gospel cannot be contained with men who are not ready to go. As much as we like and as much as we worship, the Lord is interested in us going. Joshua was told, get over this Jordan and get into the land which I'm giving to you and all these people. We don't want to leave you behind. You must come with us to the place where we are going. You must be with us as we preach this gospel. You must be part of the great commission that God has given to us. So chapter 9 verse 31, and I'll end on this, it says, and chapter 9 31, it says, then the church, churches rest, ha, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord, in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the churches were multiplied.
It means as soon as that persecution was over and the church has left Jerusalem. Look, Saul has now been converted. You will find that in verse 30. Go to verse 30. Verse 30. For us to get what this verse is saying. Verse 30, please. Verse 30. It says, which when the brethren knew, they had brought him down to Caesarea and sent him to Tarsus. This is Saul. After Saul had gotten saved, the day Saul got born again, Saul is now born again. The Bible says in verse 31, then the church has had rest. It is telling me God had finished his assignment. What was the assignment? Kick them out of Jerusalem. After he had kicked them, kicked them out of Jerusalem, the Bible tells me then the church had rest, which means God had finished his job. He had already thrusted them out. And my prayer is that we don't allow God to kick us out of Central Church. Pastor Joyce Abake Apa Pekeake. Because we have refused to go out and preach. No, no, no. We just become obedient. There's somebody who told me you can become what God wants you to become without God punishing you. Are you aware of that? Joseph would have still been the minister over his brethren without him going to Egypt. Believe me. It is very possible for you to, to, to obey God and receive your blessing without God pushing you into your blessing. And that's what we are trusting God for. Now, point number four. So the, first, the third point which you've mentioned here was that the Lord used persecution as a trusting agent. Let me go to point number four. Point number four, the, 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 the church failed to know that all believers are laborers. Let me repeat again. The early church failed to know that all believers are laborers. And what is the meaning of laborers here in our today language? I'll put it in brackets there. What? Can you shout it? Come on, I can't hear you. So it means every believer is a what? Tell your friend you are a missionary. It is not the Muzungu from America. Apana. You are a missionary to the world. All believers, not one person, all believers... Every born again believer is a laborer. That's what God, Jesus said. God thrust out every believer into the world to become a laborer for me, to be able to preach this gospel for me. How can I prove that? Let me prove through the, again these actions of the early church. If you go to Acts chapter one, chapter eight, verse one, I think I read that, but I'll repeat it again. Chapter eight and verse one, Acts eight and verse one. It says this, and Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. Now, read with me the following verses, the following words that are following there. They say, read with me, they say what? And, come on, come on, and what? Now, the word they were, who, what does the word all mean? Come on, help me. All is, a few of them, all is what? How many of you believe the Bible? When the Bible says all, does it mean others were left behind? So it's telling me, all of them, all the believers, let me add the word there, and they were all, all believers scattered where? Abroad, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, and who remained? Now ask yourself a question, why the apostles? I would have expected the apostles to have been the target. The pastors and the elders to be the ones whom, who would have been picked, kicked out of the church. But look, God doesn't kick out the apostles and the pastors. He, re he leaves them in Jerusalem. To signify, the church is a place of refueling. It's a place of discipleship. By the way, when you come, you're not coming for you to help me. I'm the one who is helping you. Actually, you come for me to give you the word so that you can be strong. For you to go into the world of your business, the world of your family, the world of your community, the world of your county, and tell people about Jesus. The moment everybody's a, a, a witness of Jesus, the Lord will come. Believe me. But as long as we are holding back, and we think it is the pastor, and we pastors have made a mistake. We have made you people believe we are the people. Because you look at me differently. We have surrounded ourselves with bodyguards. We are the anointed People come to church because the pastor has to minister to us. But I can tell you, listen, the same anointing that I have, you have. The same Holy Ghost that I have, you have. The same Spirit which is upon me, you have. And even greater than what I have, you also could be having it. And I'll prove that to you. Now listen, 
the, the, the Bible tells me the scattered church consisted of ordinary believers and not the apostles. The Lord targeted believers just as it happened at the Tower of Babel. You know, Tower of Babel, people said, look, we don't need to really scatter and go into the whole world. Let's build our own monument here and have a tower that will remind us we are one. We don't want to make a mistake of scattering. This tower, when we look at it, we'll remember where we came from and we shall assemble there. God looked from heaven, he says, uh-uh, this is not what I intended. When he made Adam, he said, he told Adam, fill the world. Do you remember that? So how do you fill the world when you are in one place? So the Lord decided he's going to do something unusual. I will give them, I will come and confuse them with their language. And that's the same language that comes to us when you receive the Holy Ghost. You know when I say, I'm talking Kisi, I'm talking Kikuyu, I'm talking Kalenjin. All of them is only the angels who understand. God brings back what we lost at Babel. So that we can use that language to go out and preach to all those nations. I hope you got me. I hope you got me. So he scattered them. So that Kikuyus can be born. Luyas can be born. Kalenjins can be born. Help me here. Kambas can be born. You can name yours. You may say Pastor Mlema is discriminating against me. I'm not. Listen. All these nations have been born out of scattering. And let me tell you again. Nations will be, a nation will be born out of scattering. As we go out, God will bring. He'll gather his people together again. And he's doing it. And now through the Holy Ghost. So the scripture tells me in Acts chapter 8. And let's go to Acts chapter 8. Verse 26 to 27. To demonstrate to you that all believers are laborers. Quickly. All believers are laborers. We've seen Stephen is dead. But his deputy, his deputy was a man called Philip. Because they appointed Stephen, Philip, Procas. If you go down, their names are written down there. Again, I said last Sunday, if we were to explain everybody, what everybody did, we can't put it in the Bible. So God has picked only two, Stephen and Philip, to show us what was happening to the others. But look at Stephen, Philip. It says, and the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Philip is still in Jerusalem. The angel of the Lord came to Philip and said, listen, now that you are out of the church, we have scattered you people. He said, arise. Can somebody say arise? And that's the same thing we are saying in our conference. We are saying what? That's what God is telling Joshua. Afanya nini? Arise and go towards the south into the way that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is a desert. Verse 27, quickly. 27. And he ro arose and went, and I trust you will arise and go. He arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of the great authority under Chades, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over the treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now you see, Philip, instead of now taking care of the people in Jerusalem, now that Stephen is dead, God tells Stephen, Philip, arise. And he says, your business is not here. Your business is out there. And he tells him, go to Gaza. Those who have been following the Palestinian war, you know what has been happen happening in Gaza, isn't it? That is a place of the Palestinians today. It was the place of the, what we call as the Philistines, those days. Akina Goliath, they were there. Gaza. The present Gaza was one of the areas God said, this one I will leave the natives of the land to stay in so that they can always be a problem to you, for you to learn war. Gaza. The five lords of the Philistines. We, I'll preach on that one of these fine days. My sermon which I preached many years ago here. The five lords of the Philistines. One of them is Gaza. So he tells him, go to Gaza, where I believe an, an ordinary Hebrew would, would not go. And in Gaza, God has strategically placed there an Ethiopian, a brother from Africa, so that the gospel can reach where? Africa. I love it. I don't want to go into details because time will not allow me. But believe me, the moment Philip met this man, Philip didn't have a lot of words. This is why I believe, even if you don't know the Bible deeply, you only need to know the basics that you need to know. And the basics are very simple. Jesus died where? On the cross, and he was done what? Buried, and he did what? resurrected and is alive. And if you believe in him and you are baptized, you will be saved. That's the message this man had. So the man was reading the scroll and he explained this, the same message to this man. And the Bible tells me as soon as he finished explaining the message, the man looked and he saw a little pool of water somewhere, an oasis. And he said, Philip, here is water. What can stop me from being baptized? Philip told him, if you believe, this way I believe the gospel is simple. Just believe and be baptized. Mambo wachana, mbegu wachana. 
mnafumbuliwa na mambegu. Jameni. Just believe the gospel. Just believe the gospel. The man believed, got out of his chariot. The Bible tells me he went out of the chariot when he went into the water. This man in the water and was baptized. Not after learning many things, after two weeks or three weeks, immediately. You know, I believe this. When you believe and you are baptized, you are saved. Baptism plus believing is equals to salvation. And there is no period that you must stay learning or being discipled for you to be baptized. Apana. The same day you believe or baptize. And you are saved. So what happened to this man? Let me show you one more scripture. Then I move away to my last point in the next five minutes. Nimalizeyo. Look at chapter 38, uh, chapter 8, verse 39 to 40. 39 to 40. It says this. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they... Come on. Okay, let's go. Okay, let's go to the verse 38 and 39. Okay, to stand still. And they went out both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and they baptized him. Look at verse 39. That's the key one. And when they were come out of the water... What happened? Come on, read it out. What happened? The spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more and the eunuch went his way doing what? The work was done. Philip had finished the assignment. That's it. The gospel has been preached. No wonder Ethiopia was never colonized. It's the only nation in Africa that was never colonized because there was no reason for a missionary to go to Ethiopia. And even today as I speak, they have their own calendar. The Ethiopians. They are not like Kenyans where they come and cheat you. Let me move to point number three. Number, number, number four, I finish. If I dwell on this one, I'll not make it. So the apostles remained in Jerusalem. But we see Philip moving away and going to that place. And he didn't end there. Verse 39 and 40, if I can finish on this, 39 and 40, you will see, I think it should be 40, verse 40. Verse 40 says, but Philip was found where? Now the spirit picked him. This is the first time somebody is being carried by an aircraft incognito. Uh, the Holy Ghost came and picked Philip. And fa he found himself in a place called where? Azotas. And then he passed through and he preached in what? Uh -uh, he preached in what? All the cities till he came to where? Now, this is the man who is supposed to be staying in Jerusalem, taking care of the food, arranging plates on the table. Now, listen. God has not called you to arrange plates on the table. He has called you to be a what? A missionary. Number five and the last one. Oh, God help me. This is the last one. He say, it says this. They failed to know that every person and every place is a mission field. Now, listen. Every person that you meet in your life is a mission field. Ask your neighbor, do your, your neighbors know you are saved? Muulize tu kwa upole. Angalia macho yake takwambia, macho macho takwambia. Okay. Turn to him and ask him or her with a lot of humility. Mwambie I'm speaking to you. Tell him like that I'm speaking to you. With humility. Does your boss know you are born again? All right. If the man tells you nothing, just know there is nothing he can tell you. But I tell you this. I'll tell you this. If you are a believer, you must preach Jesus wherever you are. Amen. Don't tell people, come to our church. I'll take you to our church. Then you bring them here expecting they'll get born again. Let them be born again in your hands. And then tell them we have a church. Bring them. And once they come here, you've done well because they're going to be discipled. Are you getting my point? So listen, every person you meet is a mission field. And every place you go is a mission place. Let me tell you this. Look at this scripture. Acts chapter 8 verse 5 to verse 8. 5 to 8. 5 to 8. And I'm I'll read this quickly. Then chapter, te chapter 8. Of course I've read that one. But let me just finish with this one. Chapter 14 verse 21. Acts 14, 21 to 23. Now Paul is now born again. Paul we know. The Paul that we know. And I strongly believe this. God wanted Philip, I mean Stephen, to preach to Paul. This is a revelation, I'm telling you. The life of Stephen was invested in the life of, of Saul. There's a scripture that says, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it abideth but alone. But if it dies, what does it do? It brings forth much fruit. It means a good seed never dies. By the way, if anything is going to happen for us here to be sacrificed for this gospel, 
it will simply be multiplying the gospel. So Stephen was sacrificed as the first martyr to of this persecution to enable the gospel to spread all over the world. And who was the man behind it? It was this man called Saul. As I said, he was one of the greatest men that we knew in the past and in the present. Saul, if you read his story in the book of Philippians 3, he tells you who he was. He says, if you are talking about a man who was smart, it was me. Re-educated, it was me. Learned, it was me. Law keeper, it was me. Keeping the law, it was me. And he explains everything about himself. So he was one of the greatest respected people. And a man full of zeal. The zeal was, I will finish these people. Now God said, listen, I will invest one seed and it will come out, spring out from you. So as Stephen was being stoned to death, Saul was listening to the gospel. And I was reading yesterday, Pastor Jimmy. I realized Stephen narrated the gospel from the days of Abraham. And took Saul through the whole journey. A lawyer who understood very well until he brought him to Jesus. Then he says, you have crucified him. And that's when Saul was, Ehh. he says, stone him, stone him. But the word had entered. And the Bible tells me a few days later, Saul is walking on the street. The Lord tells us, listen, why are you persecuting me? Again, I got a revelation. Kumbe, when we are being persecuted, you are persecuting the Lord. Are you getting the point? So the Lord was actually allowed persecution to persecute him. Then he tells Saul, now arise and go, and I will tell you what you ought to do. It is this Saul now who becomes now an agent of taking the gospel which, which Stephen and Philip would have preached out there to the whole world. This is the man who has made you sit here. This is the man who went literally, and I want to read you that scripture. You, I mean, you can read it with me here. Chapter 14, verse 21 to verse 23. We, we could begin from verse 20, probably. Verse 20 to verse 23. It says this. Let's, let's begin from 20. How about as the disciples stood around about him, this is Stephen. Stephen, the Bible says he rose up and came into the city. No, sorry, Saul. Rose up and came into the city. And the next day, he departed with Barnabas to Dabe. This is Saul. They have thrown him through the basket. He has now become a preacher. And the man now rises up and goes to Debe. And look at what the Bible says. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and had taught many, they returned again to where? Lystria and Iconium and Antioch and verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exalting them to continue in the faith and that we must through tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 23, I guess it's the last one. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed and fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. It is now Paul who opens the door for the gospel to the nations. It's the man who is now moving from point A to point B. When you read the Bible, every book after the book of Acts, apart from the book of Romans, which indeed still is part of it, all of those books are now addressed to the churches which Saul had reached through his message. And the disciples whom, I mean the apostles whom they thought would be the key men, these men were in Jerusalem. Their job was to, to give counsel, to correct, to help, to guide. And I believe that's the job of Pastor Mulema here in my team. For you guys, you go and preach. Allow me to give you guide. Allow me to give you counsel. Allow us to help you to know what to do when you are in a problem. But go and preach the gospel. I finish by saying, every person and every place is a mission place. Is a mission what? A mission what? A mission filled. And you are a missionary. May the Lord bless us. And may the Lord bless you. I think I'm done. I'll come back here to close the service. Pastor Joyce.